Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, content director for the Fatima Center, joined by Father Lawrence Carney, who is the chaplain for the Benedictine nuns out in Missouri. Father, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Mr. Rodriguez. And thank you so much for teaching us more about devotion to the Holy Face. This is our fourth in a series of five episodes on this devotion. Before we get into the particulars of this devotion in the Vale of Veronica, which you've already talked to us, Father, if you please lead us in prayer. Sure. This is a prayer of Blessed Pius IX. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. <clears throat> All my Jesus, cast upon us a look of mercy. Turn thy face towards each one of us, even as thou didst turn to Veronica. Not that we may see it with the eyes of our body, for we do not deserve to do so, but turn it towards our hearts, that, being sustained by thee, we may ever draw from that powerful source the vigor necessary to enable us to wage the combats we have to undergo. Amen. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, fathers, I started learning a little bit more about devotion to the Holy Face and reparation. Uh, one of the things that uh, I guess confused me, and I think might confuse others, is there seems to be a variety, a plethora of devotions to the Holy Face. And so, the one that we've been maybe speaking about more specifically, and in fact, the image that is behind you there in the screen, is of the Veil of Veronica. And you've talked about the Veil of Veronica. So the Holy Face devotions of the Veil of Veronica through the revelations that our Lord gave to Sister Marie of St. Peter is obviously uh, specific. So if you could perhaps tell us a little bit more about what makes it different or what the other devotions are, just to clarify it so that people would understand uh, the differences or how they're connected, um, all this devotion to the Holy Face. Yeah, so there's a number of images that are said to have been miraculously given to us by our Lord, but the ones that are most prominent and most likely to be actually true are the Shroud of Turin. Then there's another one that's possible is the Veil of Monopello, and then the Veil of Veronica. So let me go back. The Shroud of Turin deals with the death. The Veil of Monopello deals with the resurrection, and the Veil of Veronica deals with the passion. So if we can keep it simple like that, then I can explain the rest. So each one of these images stresses a particular aspect of our Lord and a different way of being devoted to his holy face. So in the Shroud of Turin, of course, that's the death. So those are the uh, winding cloths that were found in the tomb. And then the Veil of Monopello is, is this, these creatures that used to live, that were lived in the water, and there was a technique that a person would take them and sew them into this fine knit uh, type of cl cloth, and it's very expensive. And the thought is that uh, when the priests were buried in the Old Testament, they put this napkin on their face. And so the veil of Monopello is supposedly the resurrection because it, scientifically it can't be explained how it was placed on there. But what I have observed is that when Jesus rose from the dead, it's like he burned the image as he went through it. And then, of course, the veil of Veronica is the one that I am focused on. And that's the one, of course, where I mentioned in earlier episodes where Veronica, St. Veronica, which her name is also known as Seraph Seraphia, but Veronica means true icon. And that's sixth station of the cross where women were known to carry um, veils on their head in the Holy Land at the time of Christ. And they would even sometimes share that with their friends because walking around there, you there was a lot of dust and it was easy to get a dirty face. So this was part of the hospitality in the Holy Land. Well, one narrative has Jesus coming with his cross and Veronica has her veil on, but she also has a one, another one on her left arm and she breaks through the mob to console the face of Jesus. And it's really touching to see this highest woman 
having such courage to break through this mob of Roman soldiers. So imagine having 50 people surrounding Jesus, just torturing him. And all of a sudden she breaks through. The, the Roman soldiers were stunned. They didn't know what to do. So they just paused. It was like the eye of a hurricane. And Jesus fell to the ground and Veronica wept his face. And that's where we get the image. So each of these different images has a different way of being devoted to it. So the Vell of Veronica actually has an arch confraternity. It was erected in 1885 by Pope Leo XIII. And St. Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face was one of the first members to enroll, along with her dad and a few other sisters in 1885. So this arch confraternity has a certain way of being devoted to the Holy Face that's different than other devotions to the Holy Face. And so there's a lady named Saint Marie Pierre. She has this medal that um, it says, stay with us, O Lord, like the, the men walking with Jesus to Emmaus, how they went and it was getting to be um, close to Vespers. And our Lord, our Lord stayed with him when he broke bread. They, they understood who it was. Well, the image on that one is the Shroud of Turin. So it's sometimes these devotions can be conflated and it's it's important that we don't get so hung up and kind of angry and vicious about it but it's just nice to gently to know okay well this one stresses this and that one stresses that so if we can just focus on what the end game is for each one then when people decide how they wanted to be voted to the holy face then they'll know what they're getting into well, and certainly, as we spoke in our last show, a uh, very strong connection, I would argue, I think, the strongest connection between Fatima and the Holy Face and the Veil of Veronica uh, because of reparation and some of the other things we touched on in the last episode. So I hope people do uh, do visit that. One thing you struck me, and I'm here, I just quick question. I don't want to digress too much, but when you were discussing the Holy Veil of Manopello, uh, I immediately thought of in the gospel passage how when St. John and St. Peter get to the tomb and St. John believes because like there's a napkin, I think maybe is the word used, that is sort of folded up in a corner. Um, is that maybe the, the veil of Napolo or? That seems what could be a good explanation of it. Because as I mentioned, it's it was only a priestly garment that was put on the face like that. And that's what this material is. So I'm not an expert in this, but that's what my cursory reading has indicated. Okay. Well, yeah, like I said, don't want to digress. So again, we're talking more specifically about the devotion of the Veil of Veronica, which was given to Sister Marie St. Pierre. Um, in one of the episodes we've talked about, you've sort of slipped father one time instead of just saying sister, kind of calling her saint, which yeah. immediately wanted me to ask the question, um, you know, what is the status? Is she up for canonization? Uh, has she been declared venerable? Or do you know more about that by any chance? Yes, I don't know as much as I would like to know. I've been having some ambassadors of the League of St. Martin to go to talk to the director of the Holy Face in Tours, France. And we haven't gotten that much. But what he has told us is that her cause went forward, but it was stopped prematurely. So she never made it very far. And the Carmel that she was in in Tours is no longer in existence. And I don't know mm -hmm. what it was that, that brought to its closing, but I would like to get to the bottom of some of these issues. But I surmise that since she spoke about communism by name, and other revolutionary groups like Freemasons, she even talks about free thinkers, that if the church was already being infiltrated in the 1840s and beyond that, then anybody that was an infiltrator would see this is clearly going to destroy our process of infiltration. So I think that's part of it. Now, I have found a relationship to Sister Mary St. Peter. Um, she has developed a website. She's writing a book about the Holy Face and Job. And I, I contacted her on her website. I said, I want to talk to you. And she could have been anywhere in the world, but she was only an hour away from me. So 
we started inviting her to come to the convent and she started to be introduced to the Latin mass. But the thing is, she wants to promote this devotion just like I do. And I told her, well, I want your group, her little group of prayer people, I want your group to really pray about reintroducing the cause of Sister Mary de St. Pierre. And the reason why I think it's so important, not only because of reparation, but St. Therese of Lisieux wrote, read the biography of St. Um, Mary de St. Pierre, and she adopted a lot of in that biography of her devotion to the Holy Face and, and a lot of her spirituality from that. So in physics, you know, the cause is greater than the effect. So if the effect being St. Therese of Lisieux, reading sister, not saint, but sister, Mary St. Pierre is not even canonized yet. That's kind of, it just doesn't make sense. So how does a cause get reintroduced? Well, you get about a million people behind it and a lot of money, it's going to happen sometime. That's part of the, the hierarchy that needs to happen. But I think she has so many qualities of holiness that when people get devoted to this, I think God will start to show us clearly that she needs to be canonized. Well, that's interesting, Father, as you say all this, because it draws just another connection for me with Fatima. Obviously, there were three seers. Now, uh, the brother and sister Jacinta and Francisco Marto have been canonized, but Sister Lucia dos Santos, who is the privileged and primary seer, has not yet been canonized. And just as you were describing things, you know, if, if I had just sort of been overhearing the conversation, I would have thought you were talking to some extent about Sister Lucia with the Ostpolitik and, you know, the prevention of her cause. So, yes, I, I firmly believe that in, in better times, perhaps in the time of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, uh, a number of individuals will be canonized. Sister Lucia, maybe Sister Marie Pierre. Yes. Well, let me make a mention of something that a priest told me that was just about Fatima. Sister Lucia at one time was silenced by the Pope, by the Holy Father. And everyone else and the whole world was allowed to talk about Fatima except her. And then that's quite an irony that the one who's, who got all the visions, and she's the only one in the whole world who can't talk about Fatima. So talk about a punishment from God. I mean, that's what it, I think it is. But I think that just like Our Lady in the French school, St. Louis de Montfort talked about Our Lady. She wanted God not to reveal any of her glory. She wanted to be a hidden fountain to be quiet and, and stashed away. Well, God, you know, she prevailed on God and God listened to her prayers. But guess what? God is a God of justice. He's going to let the glories of Mary be revealed over time, you know? And so perhaps that's going to happen to these two women that were chosen by God to reveal these things to the world in our times. No, definitely. They suffer much. Sister Lucia suffered much by that silence, offering herself up as a victim soul, I think, to gain many graces, you know, for uh, these punishments and chastisements that, that we're enduring because we haven't obeyed Our Lady. Uh, and then also throughout the series, you have mentioned Venerable Leo DuPont. I'm not sure if people are all familiar with him. He's very closely connected since he was a big promoter of the Holy Face devotion with Vale Veronica. Could you tell us a little bit more about Venerable Leo Dupont? Oh, yes. Venerable Leo Dupont, he was born in Martinique, which is in the Caribbean in the 19th century. And he was a well-to-do man because he was the son of a sugar plantation farmer. And he became a, a lawyer, studied law in Paris. And then he came back to Martinique and married his sweetheart, and um, they had their first child, and then she was on her deathbed because she was so ill. And her last words were, um, Leo, would you promise me to take our daughter to be taught by the Ursulines in Tours? And so he promised that to her. And so he moved to Tours, France. And so that's how Providence would have it. He was born in Martinique. St. Martin was the, the Bishop of Tours. And Sister Mary de St. Pierre was going to join a Carmel outside of Tours, but there was no room. So she went to a chapel in Rennes, France, her hometown, and there's a chapel, St. Martin, and her, his relics were being displayed. And she consecrated her vocation to be a Carmelite to him. 
So the door opened up and tours. So that's how St. Martin brought them two together. And now my birthday is November 11th. And that's the feast day of St. Martin. So that's why I think God wants me to be an apostle of this. So Venerable Martin, Venerable uh, Leo DuPont is an amazing man because he's a layman. And a lot of men come to me and say, Father, there's no examples for us laymen to become holy until he came along. He wanted to be a priest, but his canonical digits were smashed in a gate when he was playing with his cousin back in Martinique. So he could never become a priest back in those days. So when he was talking to the priest, he said, well, if I can't become a priest, I still can become a saint. And so that's what he did. He became very close to Sister Mary St. Pierre, and he thought these revelations were authentic and they have great import for the future of the world. And so they came out right around the Communist Manifesto publication in 1848. And he said, when he saw the Communist Manifesto, he said, if these communists have what they want, the whole world's going to be enslaved to them someday. Well, what happened a couple of years ago? It was a dress rehearsal. What could happen to us? So Venerable Leo Pont promoted these revelations because she was a Carmelite. Sis Sister Mary St. Pierre was a Carmelite. She couldn't go out and talk about them. So he was the promoter. For 40 years, her revelations were put in the archives of the, of the archdiocese and locked up, just like uh, St. Saint, uh, Louis de Montfort's book, was The True Devotion, was covered up. And so these came out. Anyways, to make... To finish up, Venerable Leo Pont, um, blessed Pope Paul the Ninth, no Pope Pius the Ninth, he was exiled into Gaeta in 1848 and he had the bell of Veronica taken out and publicly displayed, and miracles happened. The face was very, you couldn't notice the the, the face on it, but it came out on a, a, a thin piece of silk that was right in front of it, and artists would then make engravings of it and they copy them and sent them all out to Europe and three of them went to the Carmel and two went to Venerable Little Pont and he put one in his room and that's where we get the 6,000 certified miracles based on the holy face. So God made it very clear that Venerable Little Pont is one of these great wonder workers. And lastly, Blessed Pius IX said, reparation is destined to save society. If that's a prophecy that we want to have fulfilled, we really want that one to be fulfilled because we want society to be saved so the triumph of the Immaculate Heart can happen and the triumph of the Catholic Church can happen. And Verily Le Pont is a big um, prophet in this, and he's not even a saint yet. So we've got Fatima making her saints, and we've got this devotion to the Holy Face making her saints. Well, we need to start clapping along and making this more known again. Most assuredly we do. Um, so that people know very often, uh, Leo DuPont is also called the Holy Man of Tours. So you might see that reference. That's talking about him. I think it is fascinating, again, connections that he's a layman because there's been a lot of talk lately and just the role that the lady will need to play in the restoration. Uh, much of that work of reparation needs to fall on us as well. So uh, I'm glad to have a, a layman to look up to. Uh, there is a good book out by him. We'll put that in the show more notes also that you can read that I've read. So it's one I recommend on his life. And the other connection I thought, just when you talk about all these things being hidden, um, the works, you know, St. Louis de Montfort you mentioned, we, we've talked about the third secret, or, or we haven't talked about it, but the third secret has been partially suppressed. And Sister Lucia gives us the writings of Sister Marie kind of going under, underground for a little while. Uh, we have a similar pattern with Our Lady of Good Success, not to get into that, but uh, Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres, another one who hasn't been canonized, and saw Our Lady and her body still incorrupt 400 years later, um, her cause suppressed. But also for a long time, the messages of Our Lady of Good Success down in Quito, Ecuador, have gone down my own pilgrimage a number of times and led pilgrims down there also. So there's that pattern, you know, it's sort of like the devil attacking and trying to keep the message of, of our Lord down. But we know in the end, it will certainly triumph. Um, so just a few questions here to conclude, Father, maybe so we can, maybe your example could inspire some of us. And that was just to find out a little bit more about how you got involved in this devotion, you know, why you wrote the book. And even the League of St. Martin, which you've mentioned a few times in passing, if you want to state anything about that. Sure. So I, I had a little group of men. I started a little community, and I asked 
uh, Sister Scholastica, the prioress of the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of the Apostles, I'm going to write our first newsletter. What should be our topic? And this is a nun that is not allowed to talk very much. She's not like the gatekeeper or the abbess. So she doesn't say much to me. And she said, Father, focus on the holy face. So I thought about that. And then providentially, someone sent me a book called The Holy Man of Tours from North Carolina. And they didn't know sister had just told me this. So I'm, I've got this book in my post office box. And sister just told me that. So I'm like, okay, I got to read it. Here it is. And I was amazed by his story and the connection of St. Martin, which is November 11. And I thought, well, that's my birthday. So as I kept reading more and more about it, like this devotion is for me, not only to live it, but to become an apostle of it. And so when I got more informed of this devotion and my directees and other people that you know, wanted spiritual guidance for me. I started pointing out how devotion to the Holy Face is very important for our times. And one lady read one of my, my first book called Walking the Road to God. And she, through reading it, wanted to become a Catholic. And when she converted, she became um, our business manager for the League of St. Martin. The League of St. Martin is a pious association of faithful that promotes devotion to the Holy Face and devotion to the Holy Rosary. Well, as she worked for us, she was a great person in, uh, in marketing. Little did I know, she approached Tan Publishers without me telling her to, without me knowing, and said, you need to get Father Carney to write a book on the Holy Face. So without me knowing that, I get this email from Tan saying, would you like to write about the Holy Face? And I, I called up my spiritual director and I said, yeah, Father, this is what's going on. And what do you think I should do? And he says, well, are you going to write the book or what? I said, well, I'm asking you for permission. And he said, go for it. So that's how I got involved with writing the book. And I think that God has kickstarted this movement. And I think that there's going to be something really beautiful at the end of this. If I'm faithful and if people that are listening to me are faithful to what God wants, he demands reparation for blasphemy and for profanation of Sundays and holy days. And this is a very manly devotion. And I like the manly prayers that these French uh, priests who helped Sister Mary St. Pierre put together the Arch Confraternity after she died in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 90s. These are some really manly prayers, and I love it. I just love it, and I hope that my love of this spreads out to your um, viewers. Let's uh, keep that intention in our prayers. Thank you so much, Father. No, it's, it's great to hear those. God God is awesome and the connections he brings, how his grace works in our life. Truly something for us to praise and to stand in awe of. So we've got one last show that we'll pick up tomorrow. And I think maybe it's in some ways the most important question, the one that always uh, will press upon us, and that's what can Catholics then do? How do they practice this devotion? So we'll go ahead and uh, address that tomorrow. Father, if you would, please uh, conclude us in prayer again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, dear viewer. We'll see you tomorrow when we find out what you can do and how you can live out this devotion. God bless you.